Hello, everybody, and welcome. We are going to go ahead and get started here. It's the top of the hour. We got a lot of material to cover, so we want to try and give you as much of this as possible and also leave time for questions. This is the Caverno Overview and What's New session. Thank you, everybody, for being here. My name is Chip Zoller. I am a Caverno maintainer, and I'm joined by my colleague, Zach Swanson. Hi, I am Zach Swanson. I'm a staff engineer at Wayfair. And this is us, if you wanted to confirm our physical identities. All right, so before we get started, if I can just get everybody's attention for two minutes. So if you got a phone, laptop, just put it down for one second. By a show of hands, who here does not know anything about Caverno or have never heard of it? Who doesn't know anything about Caverno? Okay, cool, hands down. Now, another question for you. Who here is using no policy whatsoever in production in at least one environment? If you're not using any form of policy today. All right, all right. Well, we got a lot of good stuff to talk to you about today. All right, so first of all, for those that, that raised your hand that you aren't using policy today, why do we need policy? All right, well, number one, Kubernetes is not secure by default. Uh, a lot of people that have not heard this are kind of surprised to hear this is the case. There are security elements, there are security tools in Kubernetes, of course, but by default, it does not have the security posture that's acceptable to most production environments. RBAC, which is a pivotal piece of Kubernetes security and indeed any type of platform, only takes you so far. So you can't do some things that you necessarily need to do, and RBAC is only going to run, it has a runway. Uh, so policy can be used to extend our back to your specific use cases. Your governance is your business. Kubernetes is just an engine. It has the tools that are available, but ultimately what you need for your environment, for your organizations, that's your governance structure. That's really on you to figure out. You can use the tools to do that, but nobody knows what labels you need on there, what you shouldn't do in some situations that go beyond basic security. And not everyone is an expert at this stuff. Like, Kubernetes is hard. Anyone here think Kubernetes is easy? Like, you got it in the bag, no problems with it? Yeah, I don't see too many hands going up. So this stuff is difficult, and not everyone's an expert. So it's also about creating guardrails that help people do things that they should do, not because they have malicious intent, but because sometimes we forget and we need a little bit of help. Automation of operations can be a game changer. Policy isn't just for security. It's not just for preventing bad people from doing bad things. It's also about helping you and your jobs as DevOps engineers or whatever your role might be by eliminating some uh, manual efforts that you could be performing. And we need less complexity, not more. Policy can help us reduce complexity, consolidating workloads and consolidating tools into one. Of course, depending on the policy engine, which, which if you're not familiar with Caverno, if you're one of the ones that raised your hands, you'll quickly see that it's quite capable and it allows you the ability to reduce that complexity. All right, for those that do not know, what is Caverno? Uh, the word Caverno is Greek for govern. This is a CNCF incubating project. Uh, it is growing very rapidly, started obviously in the sandbox. Now it's an incubating project. Uh, it is an admission controller and then some, as you'll see. But at its heart, Caverno is an admission controller for Kubernetes. It is purpose-built for Kubernetes. It was not originally designed for use cases outside of Kubernetes. Uh, we'll be making some announcements here that will change that, but it was purpose-built for Kubernetes, not a general purpose policy engine. As a result of that, the next bullet, which is why most people tend to uh, like and use Caverno, there is no programming language or knowledge of one that's required. So one of the first questions that we get is, how does this differ from something like OPA or Gatekeeper? Both of those require Rego. Caverno does not. Caverno uses simple policy syntax and language that does not require that you do any programming. Uh, it's also the most popular uh, policy engine that we found for Kubernetes, and it has the largest policy engine of any policy uh, library that's out there. Uh, I think currently we have just over 300 sample policies, so a lot of stuff that can get you started. Uh, these are some of the Caverno adopters, so a lot of large companies are using this in production. Uh, with more that are added every single day. And here's some of the broad use cases, not just for policy in general, but what uh, policy inside of Caverno can enable. So pod security, this is sort of the quintessential use case. 
where most policy engines begin and end. This is what most people think of when they think of policy. It's, oh no, security, we need something so that pods don't run as root, so that they don't run host path, et cetera, et cetera. Of course, Coverno does this very elegantly, very simply, but that's just really the beginning. Uh, Fine-grained RBAC, so you can do things like only users that have this role can create a secret that has this specific label key and value. So again, I talked about augmenting RBAC. This isn't something that you can do with Kubernetes RBAC today, but with a policy engine like Caverno, you can do this. Cost control. Many elements of cost control that are out there, but one of them, which is a pretty predominant one, say you're running in a public cloud provider, you want to be able to say something like, perhaps only one service of type load balancer can be created in AWS. Why? Because that has cost. So you want to be able to limit things that have cost implications that are in your infrastructure. Uh, ops automation. So you can do things like sync this config map everywhere when my cert is updated. So Caverno can watch that and perform synchronizations and create new resources, and we'll get into that. Uh, Multi-tenancy. Um, Multi-tenancy is a big deal. It doesn't necessarily mean multiple customers, Coke and Pepsi, coexisting on the same cluster. A lot of organizations internally operate like uh, they're a multi-tenanted business. Caverna can be used to do things that help you along your journey to get multi-tenancy by eliminating some manual steps. Like, for example, every time you see a new namespace be created, create these three additional resources in that and do some things to them. And also supply chain security. Supply chain security, very hot topic. Uh, Caverno has deep uh, support for all sorts of elements of supply chain security. So for example, all images that have this name or that come from this registry and are of this repository must be signed with a, uh, must be signed and attested using this key, uh, so on and so forth. So these are some of the broad use cases that Caverno supports. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Zach and give you a little bit uh, so he'll give you a little bit about how Wayfair is using Caverno in their journey. Thanks, Chip. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, if you're not aware of Wayfair, we are the destination for all things home. We are an e-commerce platform in the home goods market. Uh, we've got about 14,000 employees right now, around 2,000 engineers. Uh, we, uh, most of our compute is on GKE, uh, and everyone pushes to Kubernetes. We have about 15,000 deploys into production every month. That's around 500 every day. Uh, and that all gets processed through our Caverno uh, admission policies that we use. Uh, so a little bit of the scale that we're running. Um, we, this is sort of an, a, an aggregate of uh, all of our Kubernetes clusters for the, uh, taken at a snapshot last week. Uh, we run at a fairly large scale. We run large multi-tenant clusters, multi-tenant being all of our developers, right? We treat each of those as an isolated tenant. Uh, we're running about 56 uh, validate rules. The number kind of fluctuates depending on what's going on at any given moment. We, we add and remove them as necessary. Uh, and around 20 mutate policies. And about 10 of those, are, 10 of those rules are firing at any given moment, okay? And just a bit of the scale, all right. Uh, so what are we doing with Caverno? Uh, we kind of broadly uh, categorize these into two different things. And the first one is we protect the platform. There's pod security, as, as Chip alluded to. Uh, that's sort of the usual thing, uh, right, that everybody thinks of. Uh, but we're also doing things like uh, preventing uh, someone from redeclaring an ingress host, right, uh, and routing traffic to a, a different service than was intended, or redeclaring uh, a TLS using a cert manager that is actually managed external to the cluster, right, uh, stuff like that. Uh, we've used it to prevent some difficult to debug situations, uh, preventing users from enabling certain features uh, that make it hard for us to track down what they've broken. Uh, at, at another point that Chip made, right, is uh, uh, locking down the types of ingress that users can create uh, so that they're locked into the platform, all right? Uh, security, if you uh, attended the Ingress Nginx uh, uh, meeting yesterday and learned about sort of the CVEs uh, that they've had recently. We're using Caverno to help lock down, lock down those annotations, right? Um, other stuff is, you know, making sure that uh, you, if you're using an HPA or a pod disruption budget that you're using that in a way that works for the platform since you can inadvertently kind of shoot yourself in the foot there. Uh, we use namespace labels uh, a lot in the policies to target them. So not every policy is broadly applicable to every namespace and every application. And we use the namespace filtering in Caverno to help with that. Uh, 
And another big thing that we do is we change the platform out from under the devs without the devs really having to do anything. So when you're running at 2,000 plus developers and four to 5,000 applications that are flowing, uh, right, and earning money for your company, uh, we try to minimize having to go out to the developers and ask them to change things, right? Because asking, asking them to update 4,000 plus GitHub repos to change an ingress class uh, is gonna take months, right? Uh, and at some point you're gonna end up having to do it for them, right? So here's just some examples of things that we've done with mutating policies uh, to change things, right? We've swapped uh, from the deprecated ingress annotation of, for ingress class over to the ingress class name without requiring devs to update their Helm charts uh, or, or change any of their configurations. We automatically set image registries uh, for pods. That allows us to uh, fail over from one registry region to another if we have to, but also so the devs don't have to worry about what the, the end state of the image registry looks like. They, they just know my image is tagged as you know, Wayfair or my app, right? And, that, and that's all they have to worry about. Uh, the SEO team has used this to seamlessly migrate teams uh, between a gateway class that they're deprecating over to a new one uh, to change how uh, the architecture of the network worked, right? Uh, we recently uh, adjusted a, uh, uh, the Kubernetes default scheduler a little bit to improve bin pack. Uh, and once we had proved that out, we uh, mutated everyone's uh, workload so that they automatically used the, uh, the new scheduler configuration and, and improved our efficiency on our compute platform. Uh, and then another big win, uh, a uh, kind of an add-on that we do for our workloads, uh, discovered that we were over-provisioning resources, uh, and we, with a simple mutation policy, we're able to, without having to ask anybody to update a chart or do anything, we automatically reduce everyone's usage of those resources, and we save tens of thousands of dollars a month uh, for our application developers. So, okay, uh, a quick, uh, uh, I'm not gonna go over all of this for you, so <laughs> this is a lot. Uh, why did we migrate to Caverno? Uh, we were on Gatekeeper before. We didn't have a lot of Rego experience. Rego is difficult. Uh, the documentation for it is rather tricky, we found. There's distinct differences between Gatekeeper and OPA, and they're not obvious, and the documentation is not very obvious on that. Uh, we came to have a very high reliance on Stack Overflow examples, uh, where you discovered that there's 10 different ways to do any single thing in Gatekeeper. Uh, and, and a key thing for us was we didn't have a centralized policy team uh, organizing all policy across all of Wayfair. Uh, so uh, infrastructure was using you know, Terraform Sentinel, uh, security uh, has their own uh, tooling that they were doing. So we didn't have a requirement to stay in OPA because we were doing this centralized. So after we moved to Caverno, uh, there's a enormous policy library publicly available, right, for, that we can refer to uh, and use uh, if, if it's applicable. Uh, we drastically reduced the resourcing that we were spending uh, on Gatekeeper. We went from running about 14 to 20 pods on average of Gatekeeper just to keep it happy with uh, acceptable admission latencies to running the minimum three pod HA of Caverno uh, and reducing the amount of CPU and memory allocated to it at the same time uh, with no impact to the, the platform. Uh, we found uh, the Caverno community is very active. Uh, I'm, I'm a part of it. I'm in the, the Slack channel a lot. Uh, it's responsive. You get answers to questions. You get help. And, and there's a, uh, the community is willing to engage with everyone. Um, we had uh, an engineer that spent over a week trying to write a fairly simple policy in Gatekeeper and just work through the syntax and how to test that. And when we went to Caverno, he wrote the exact same thing in under a day uh, with tests uh, and validated it uh, without having to actually read any Caverno documentation. He's able to just look at examples and discern how to make it work. It was fantastic. Okay. Uh, just real quick, how we migrated, uh, this is uh, fairly straightforward. Uh, we started with just a proof of concept demo to the team where I took the most complex gatekeeper constraint that we had that was perceived to be very complicated and then proved that, hey, yes, this does translate into Caverno, right? Uh, even though Caverno is not a fully qualified programming language, it's able to handle the, this big constraint that everybody is very concerned about, right? Uh, we took that and then one by one, uh, shifted, started you know, uh, retooling Gatekeeper constraints into Caverno and deployed Caverno in parallel with Gatekeeper. 
uh, started building confidence in what we had built using the Caverno testing utilities, and then started one by one activating Caverno policies from auditing mode, where they're taking no action, <coughs> excuse me, uh, into enforce mode. And that way, while Gatekeeper was running and while Caverno was running at the same time, we could verify that, yeah, they have the, they have the same output, right? They're blocking the same things, they're allowing the same things, uh, nothing unexpected. Uh, and then at that point, we're able to just slowly start disabling uh, the gatekeeper constraints one by one. Uh, point here being, uh, migrating, if you're already on OPA and you'd like a simpler solution, it, it's not hard to switch to Caverno. It was a fairly straightforward process. So, all right, over to Chip. Thank you, Zach. All right, so uh, with that, let's take a look at a feature walkthrough. We'll get into some more details here. All right, so first up, let's look at the components of Caverno. Not gonna boil this slide, but on the left, the cluster-wide resources, just like a lot of tools, you get you know, all, all of your RBAC components. Caverno will create and manage dynamically the webhooks based on the policies you, that you have deployed. Uh, each of the colored sets of boxes corresponds to one different type of controller. So Caverno is broken out into different types of controllers. There's an admission controller. There's one that handles background generation tasks report tasks and cleanup tasks. And I'll go over what these are in just a minute. Uh, so naturally, uh, each of those things have their own set of uh, services and a bunch of other uh, assistive, assistive devices and resources that, are, uh, that make them up. So a policy structure, this is what a Caverno policy looks like. If you've never seen one, I'll show examples of that. A policy is a container basically for rules where one rule can be of uh, any of the types that are down at the bottom. So validate, mutate, generate, verify images. Don't worry, we'll go over those. Uh, each rule also has to have a match block. You have to match on what it is that you want to do something to. Uh, you can optionally have an exclude block and those things over there to the right, the bulleted list are all of the things that you can both match and exclude on. As you can see, it's fairly extensive. You can even do labels and annotations. One thing to call out here is Caverno will actually allow you to match on your roles and cluster roles uh, because it will calculate or determine that at the time the request is made. This is not something that Kubernetes normally surfaces by default in an admission review request uh, for those that may be familiar with that. So these are some live examples of what a typical Caverno policy looks like. So on the left, you have a validation rule. This is the yes or no response. Uh, this one is just checking for a label, and I'm willing to bet that you can probably determine what that's doing if you've never even seen a Caverno policy before. As you can see, there's no rego, there's no programming, it's just a simple overlay syntax. Uh, policies can be more complicated, but these are very simple examples. The one on the right is a mutation. This is going to add fields if they do not exist with the values that you see there. Again, no programming language. Validation, let's, let's get into a little bit more of what validation means. So this is the, uh, the most common policy type. This is the yes or no response. Here's a resource that the Kubernetes API is sending. You have a matching policy. Do you allow it, yes or no? Has to be one of the two responses, yes or no. Uh, this is the most common rule type. So if every example of pod security, these are all gonna fit into the validation space. Here's a pod, what do you think of it? Should we allow it because it's good or should we deny it because it's bad? Uh, validate rules can be written in two primary different ways. You can either use a pattern overlay, which is what the previous example showed. This is for more simple policy styles. Uh, many of them uh, that we see employed uh, use these simple patterns, or they can get more complex by using these advanced level of expressions. There are currently two failure behaviors that, that validate policies uh, are capable of. One is an audit mode in which the resource will be allowed no matter its disposition, uh, or in force, it will be blocked if it's bad. Uh, another cool capability of validate that, that some folks may not know about is that Caverno also has the ability to validate YAML manifest signatures. So uh, without going into too much detail, there's a project out there called SigStore many of you may have heard of. They have a tool called Cosign. There's a sub-project that allows you to sign YAML manifests. Caverno can actually verify the signature on a manifest, so this is great for preventing, for example, tamper-proofing of just tactical fields that are inside of that resource if you wanted to employ that. Uh, mutation, so mutation modifies a resource. This always occurs first in the admission chain, so whenever an admission review uh, comes through, all of the mutations will happen first, followed by validation second. 
uh, two ways that you can write these rules. You can either write them using a strategic merge patch, which is that simple overlay style pattern shown at the top on the right side, or you can use a JSON patch. No funny business here. This is your standard RFC 6902 JSON patch. You probably use them in other commands and other tools. You can copy and paste those into Caverno and use those there if you like. Uh, another nice thing about Caverno that, uh, at least to my knowledge, other policies don't really have is you can mutate existing resources. So you can do something like watching an event and then mutating a config map that already exists in the cluster. So not only can you mutate something that pre-exists, which is uh, not something that comes through the admission re review process, you can mutate something different. Oh, and also, uh, if you're interested in on uh, at the bottom there, there's a link, and these slides are already uploaded, by the way. Uh, there's a blog I wrote that goes into how you can even take this to sort of the nth degree and set up a one-time passcode system using quotas, all using Caverno. Kind of neat to look at that generate, uh, mutate existing case. Uh, generation, so this is what will create a new resource in your cluster in response to something else that happens in the cluster. Uh, the source of this can be a clone, as in here's an existing resource that's already out there. I want you to create the new thing for me, but base it off of another resource, or you can define it in the policy. So the right side there shows an example of one of these generate policies uh, in which the uh, in which Caverno is generating a new network policy every time a namespace is going to be created. And you can see there that the, the contents of that network policy are defined in the policy itself. Uh, this also has a synchronization ability, um, so any changes to the source resource, if you're using a clone or a trigger resource, the triggering resource will result in that having an influence on the downstream resource. This is naturally good for tamper resistance because if somebody tampers with the downstream resource and you have synchronization enabled, it will revert that resource back to its previous state. Uh, declaratively defined in the policy. Uh, this is nice because it obviates or can obviate the need for specialized or platform specific operators. There are several different operators that are out there that do something very similar to this. You can converge several of those into just Caverno and eliminate some of those other tools. Caverno also has the ability to generate for existing resources. So all of us have some sort of definition of what brownfield means. You've got an existing cluster with some workloads that are already there. You can do something like, for example, introduce a new Caverno policy and say, for the existing namespaces that are there, not the new ones, give me a network policy that looks like this. That's generation. Image verification. So Caverno has the ability to verify image signatures. So these are uh, container images that have been signed either with cosign or notary. Uh, this is able to also verify attestation. So if you're attesting images, if you're using salsa provenance, if you're using an attested SBOM, if you're using attested vulnerability scans, et cetera, et cetera, Caverno can verify not only that the, att the attestations exist, but that contents in the structure look a certain way. This is all integrated. There's nothing additional to install. If you don't want this, you simply don't write a policy that requests it. There's no other components to install. Any OCI registry is supported. Caverno is not, uh, is not specific about which registry. Uh, and also with the new changes that are coming, uh, the OCI 1.1 specification that has what's called refers API, Caverno supports this. Won't go into detail on that. There are other sessions going on this week uh, that talk about refers API, Caverno supports that. Uh, this supports uh, keys, including KMS from different providers, certificates, and key lists that, uh, that uh, Cosign offers. Uh, you can uh, also perform decision caching. This is a new enhancement that, uh, that we're bringing out. So whatever the decision was, Caverno can cache that and not have to go look up those signatures time and time again. And you can do multi-way checks, so very granular. You can do things like any of these uh, keys must uh, match, all of them at least one, whatever the case is. So that's image verification. Cleanup, Caverno has the ability to help you in your job by keeping your clusters nice and tidy, reducing costs, uh, reducing sprawl. Uh, there are two different mechanisms that you can do. Number one, surprise, a policy. You can write a policy that enables you to clean up these resources through a definition and also something new that we are bringing out in the next version. You can simply apply a label, a time to live label, and based on the, the time that's there, Caverno will expire that resource, see it, and then remove that. Uh, this uses the same Caverno policy concepts as all the other rule types. 
You will need explicit permissions. Uh, Caverno uh, attempts as best as we can to ship with minimum privileges. So if you want to clean up specialized things, you may need to grant it additional privileges. It'll tell you, by the way, if you try and create a policy and it doesn't have those. Some use cases for this are things like removing cruft in your cluster. We've all got some bare pods that are sitting around that we've done some troubleshooting. Uh, resource expiration dates, if you want something to be short-lived and want it automatically removed, you can do that. And eliminating things like violating resources. This dovetails nicely with Caverno's other rule types like validate, mutate, generate. You can do things like saying only these types of people are able to assign that label or change the value or remove it. You can mutate a resource that automatically adds this label, et cetera, et cetera. So that's cleanup. Policy reports. So this is an in-cluster report on the results of validate and verify images rules. This is an open standard from the Kubernetes policy working group. So this is not a Caverno specific thing, but this is an open standard that other tools in the ecosystem also adopt. This decouples policies from the results of those policies. What this means is that you don't have to go parsing through policy engine logs. You don't have to go looking at the status object of a policy to see its effects. You look at this resource that's in the cluster called a policy report, and it will give you all of that information, uh, which means that you can do things like entitle it to different uh, users and roles. This uh, empowers things like developer self-service, because now nobody has to even look at a policy to know the results. You can just have them look at the policy report. Uh, this will provide results from admission mode, so it, uh, review, uh, resources that are coming in through the admission review process, or by background scans. Caverna will periodically, if you enable it, uh, background scan the cluster and look at the resources that match policies and tell you how they line up in these policy reports. Uh, this will assess rules that are in audit mode prior to enforce. So as Zach mentioned, uh, this can be and often is a way to migrate to Caverno if you're using something else. Maybe you're using PSPs and you still haven't gotten off of them or something else. Put your policies in audit mode. Look at the policy reports. When you feel confident that they're correct, then you can flip over to enforce mode. Uh, there's a namespaced and a cluster scoped variant. And you got a bunch of different results in the policy reports. Uh, there is an open source tool that's in the Caverno organization called Policy Reporter. It's got a nice UI, works with any policy report. You can do things like sending alerts to remote destinations, emails, got metrics, a bunch of other things. So I encourage you to go take a look at that if you're interested in that. And policy exceptions. So policy exceptions are a custom resource type. And on the right there, you can see an example of one. This decouples ownership and life cycle of exclusions from policies. So Caverno has the ability to exclude things that are in a policy. But you can also break that out into its own separate resource, which allows uh, self-service so that developers and other users can say, I, I don't know anything about Caverno. I don't have access to look at the rules, but I need an exception. So I'm, I'm going to request a policy exception and uh, it, it can, um, you can accept the resource as a result of that. Uh, this will also factor into policy reports. So you can see if there's a policy exception that's provided there. And this can allow even pretty granular uh, exclusions for things even like per image. Um, you can use RBAC, GitOps, and even other Caverno policies to provide some guardrails for those, uh, including things like YAML manifest validation that I talked about on the validate slide. Uh, so testing, Caverno has a couple of nifty tools that you can use to test. It has a CLI. Um, this is uh, a standard Golang um, fully compiled CLI that allows you to test policies outside of a cluster. So great for that shift left. Uh, you can test for specific results using the test command, or you can check unknown manifests and see the results of policies by using apply. Uh, as I said, mentioned using it in uh, pipelines. Uh, we've got a kube control plugin that's available for, through crew, uh, a GitHub action that you can quickly plumb in, and of course, just manually download. And then uh, fairly new here, the Caverno Playground. This is a web-based graphical policy editor and tester. And there's a public instance available at playground.caverno.io. You can also run it on premises if you want. We have a Helm chart that allows you to do that easily or a standalone binary. It gives you access to some more advanced Caverno settings that the CLI didn't. Um, super nice, got a bunch of extra capabilities. And some of those capabilities uh, are shown here. So here's just a quick uh, little demo. Uh, on the left side is a policy, on the right is some resources. Click the start button and it's gonna give you the validation results. And you can see the results of uh, what the application of that validate rule. 
And now you can go do uh, a mutate rule, for example. Same sort of situation. We'll see what the mutation is going to be when we click start here. And it'll show you that it passes the mutation. And if you want to see exactly what Caverno did, open the details page and boom, right there, you can see the highlighted fields of what your source resource was and what Caverno did to change that resource. All very simple and easy to use. Uh, so these are your additional things we don't have time to cover, but if you're interested, the slides are available, as I said. These all link to different things that are uh, on the Caverno homepage. Caverno's got a bunch of other di different abilities that assist in your ability to write policies. Uh, policy library with 300 policies, uh, distributed tracing, uh, pod security admission libraries baked in. I'm not going to drain this. Um, and now what's new? So uh, this is the meat for a lot of folks. So Caverno 1.11 is our next release. This should be available very soon. We have release candidates that are currently available. Validating admission policy. Caverno is the first policy engine that has validating admission policy support in four different ways. You can write validate rules using cell expressions, what is what, which is what validating admission policies support today. You can have Caverno generate and manage those validating admission policies from those cell-based validate rules if they make use of certain qualified policy language. You can also test validating admission policies in the Caverno CLI. So if you didn't want to use a Caverno policy at all, you just wanted to be able to test your validating admission policies, the Caverno CLI supports you to be, to be able to test those outside of a cluster. And you can generate policy reports from those validating admission policies. Some other enhancements that are in 111 policy reports now are results are now per resource. Previously, they were per policy. Uh, Cosine 2.0 support's been added. This includes notary updates and also that uh, refers API that I mentioned earlier. Uh, that cleanup TTL label that I also talked about, that is a new addition in 111. So you can assign that label, and Caverna will automatically track and scrub those resources when that expires. And there's been some massive CLI refactoring uh, along with a new test schema that'll help keep you on the guardrails. Two new projects that uh, we'd like to announce today. Uh, one of them is called Chainsaw. This is a new test tool that was uh, inspired by another tool that's in the CNCF. This allows you to test any sort of operator that you want. It's not, there's no dependency on Caverno. You can use this to test uh, other operators and other resources. And now Caverno supports JSON. So typically, or in the past, Caverno was a policy engine that was only limited to Kubernetes. We're glad to announce that that is no longer the case. Caverno now supports arbitrary JSON, so you can use this in pipelines to test anything that you want. Any JSON that you can provide it, you can write a Caverno policy and be able to validate that and, and follow those links for more information. Uh, what's next? We are currently planning for graduation. Um, uh, so we're working towards that. Uh, we're going to be looking at resource caching for anything, uh, version 2 APIs, uh, so our policies are up to, up to date. A new warning mode uh, for each, uh, loops for generate rules, some policy exception enhancements, and aggregated APIs for policy reports are what we're looking at. Uh, here's a way to get involved. Uh, come see us in booth F19. A couple other sessions that are happening on Thursday. Uh, the rest of this you can see on the slides when you get them. And with that, we have about two minutes for questions. If you have a question, please step to the mic so that we have that on the recording. Afterwards, if there are any folks that have lingering questions, let's take those out in the hallway so that we can allow the next presenter to come up and get set. So glad to uh, take your questions now if there are any. And otherwise, please scan the QR code and give us some feedback on the session. We'd love to hear it. Thank you very much. Right, so just to repeat the question for the recording if it didn't show up, so how do you balance or reconcile mutations with some state that could be stored in Git? Good question. The answer is, it really depends on what you're doing. There are some things that you really don't want to mutate, 
and you want to either provide validations for or make sure that you shift that as far left as possible. In other cases, though, there are runtime data that you cannot get any other way. So depending on what you're doing, you may need an ID or you may need a UID or some sort of something that's just not possible to have codified in Git. It's also fine to add, typically it's, tip, it's, it's generally fine when it comes to mutations to add fields. When you start running into problems is when you change fields that your GitOps controller believes that it, uh, that it owns. Wayfair is shifting to Argo, yeah, as the bootstrap. Yeah, we're doing the standard kind of Terraform do-it-yourself at the mo at the moment, and we're moving away from that. Yeah, well, I, I think I can address it. The question, the question is, uh, when we're bootstrapping clusters, do you also include all the policies? And uh, for our purposes, the answer would be yes. Uh, Caverno would be a later dependency that would come in on the Argo chain. Um, yeah, yeah. So we, yeah, it would be in a later. Caverno would come in a later sync wave. Yes. All right, and we are, we are unfortunately out of time for questions, so thank you, everybody, again. And please, if you'd like to follow up with us on questions, we'll, we're going to take them outside, so give us just a minute to get wrapped up here. Thank you very much.